So we are considering uh, low Reynolds number solutions. So these are the flows that are described by Stokes equation. Uh, when the Reynolds number is low, we showed through non-dimensionalization that we can uh, neglect the inertia term in the Navier-Stokes equations and we arrive with the form that's known as Stokes equation. As an example of a practical problem, I wanted to go over a Heller-Shaw flow and this is the flow between two infinite parallel closely spaced plates. Now the flow is pressure driven between them so we expect a velocity profile that would be zero at the plates and some kind of ma maximum velocity value in the middle. An interesting feature of those flows that with uh, some uh, special considerations we could use that to visualize potential flow solutions and I'm going to talk about that towards the end. But in terms of the derivation of the solution, the Stokes equation is just del rho uh, equals uh, mu times del squared v minus rho g. This is for a steady flow. We can write those equations in uh, the Cartesian coordinates for x, y, and z directions separately in terms of u, v, w velocity components and x, y, and z coordinates. We consider those three equations in conjunction with the continuity equation and that is just del v equals zero or du dx plus dv dy plus dw dz equals zero. If h, which is the spacing between the plates, so the spacing between the plates is 2h in our notation, if that is small, then we can assume that the velocity in the z direction, velocity perpendicular to the plates is negligible. And that simplifies the z direction momentum equation to d rho, dp dz equals minus rho g. So if we integrate that, then we arrive at the expression that pressure is just minus rho g z, the hydrostatic uh, term, plus some function of x and y. In the x and y uh, directions, uh, we, again, I mentioned that we are expecting a velocity profile that uh, where velocity is zero at the plates and its maximum value is in the middle of the channel formed by the plates. Uh, that channel is small. This is our key assumption. H is smaller than the length of the plates. Therefore, the changes, the gradients of velocity in the z direction of all flow parameters in the z direction are expected to be much larger than changes in either x or y direction. So the corresponding derivatives, partial derivatives uh, with respect to z are larger than partial derivatives with respect to x or y. That simplifies the x and y direction equations to dp dx equals mu second derivative of u with respect to z and in the y direction dp dy equals mu second derivative of v with respect to z. We can integrate both of those equations twice to come up with expressions for u and v. Those would have, each one of those ex equations would have uh, constants uh, of integration. We call them c1 through c4. And we can find those in the usual way uh, by substituting boundary conditions, which we know a priori. The boundary conditions are no slip at the walls. So both u and v velocities are equal to zero at the walls, z equals plus minus h. And also we can assume symmetry. Our flow is symmetric around the middle mid plane of the channel. Uh, so du dz and d v dz should be zero at z equal to zero. So now uh, symmetry implies the maximum of velocities at the symmetry plane. Maximum means uh, zero derivative. That gives us expressions for u and v. And this is an interesting part. Let's consider a fixed plane cross section uh, in the uh, Heller-Shaw cell, this 
channel between the two plates, consider a fixed location, fixed z location. So z equals to some value z0. At that plane, the velocities u and v can be written as derivatives of the same function. So let's say if z equals to that 0, which is a constant, then u is d by dx of z0 squared minus h squared over 2 mu times pressure, and v is d by dy of the same function, z0 squared minus h squared over 2 mu times pressure. Let's call that function inside the brackets capital Phi. Then the velocity vector v is the gradient of this scalar function, so which is a remarkable result. Uh, the flow, that function, capital Phi, is in fact a potential for the vector field. We talked about earlier about the necessary condition for existence of potential. The flow must be irrotational. Uh, so the curl of velocity must be equal to zero for potential to exist. Uh, also, irritationality is linked to flow being inviscid. So the, uh, the only way to induce rotation of, on the fluid element that travels in the flow without initial rotation is to apply shear stresses on the surface of that fluid element. Those shear stresses are viscous forces by nature. Uh, so if the flow has viscous forces that are significant, it would be rotational, therefore potential would not exist. Uh, here is a somewhat contradictory example. We showed uh, very clearly that potential does exist. Also, the flow is clearly viscous. This is what we started with. The Stokes equation is the viscosity dominated flow. So how is that possible? Well, the sleight of hand is that we're considering a fixed Z plane, uh, Z0. We, we can examine what the vorticity uh, is uh, at that plane. So uh, vorticity is the curl of velocity. We can just write uh, the expression for that in Cartesian coordinates. So if we look at the omega Z, the out of plane vorticity component, that would be zero according to our assumptions but omega x and omega y generally speaking would not be zero so it, it is a rotational flow but in any given plane if we consider a 2d flow so to speak the for 2d the only relevant vorticity component is omega z and that is zero uh, as, as we can see. So that what allows us in the lab, if we construct a helitro cell using say two very large plexiglass plates and we inject a dye to visualize the flow over a cylinder that's embedded say between those plates, then the streaks of dye would uh, show us a very close approximation of the potential solution. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one way of looking at potential flows in the lab and having a glimpse of it. But in reality, of course, there is no paradox. If you look very close to the surface of an object in, in a Halesha cell, you would um, actually be able to detect a boundary layer where there is non-zero vorticity.